I'm going to take my stab at talking about a good society based on learning from the best teacher, nature. I hope to convince you by the end of my talk that it is everyone's collective responsibility to help promote science and science literacy. As the best teacher, let's look what nature has taught us. Some of the best societies we've studied are social insects, bees, ants. They have specialists among them who take on unique roles in the society. Later on, I'll talk about the fact that these specialists can only do their jobs well if they function at a high level and they communicate between the specialized groups. When an ant colony suffers an upset, all of the players abandon their normal routine and follow a program that allows them to rebuild the colony or reestablish a new colony. In biology, a field that I know best, there are many levels of specialization. And from each, we can learn important lessons. At the cellular level, my best study system, bacteria, are the premier chemists of our world. Here, you see a picture of bacteria taking over the surface of an inanimate object. By doing that, they're laying down a complex matrix, the likes of which the adhesive properties um, require heavy artillery, such as what your dental hygienists use to get the plaque off of your teeth. In the right panel, you see chloroplasts, derived originally from cyanobacteria, but functioning in plant cells to harness the energy from the sun, take CO2, something that we cannot use, and produce sugar. That's a true specialist. Probably the most specialized cell I can think of that we're familiar with are neurons. In fact, for many years, people debated whether neurons were cells. Their processes were so tiny and so difficult to see by microscopy that it had to be Ramoni Cajal who developed the stain that allowed us to visualize and show that these were cells for the first time. But what's more remarkable about a neuron that can it, it receive information and deliver information is the fact that they can be organized into networks. And in some, in some animals, that's all there are, networks of neurons that allow them to do complex behaviors. But in us, we reach the organ level, where neurons are organized into specialized domains in the brain, each of which has a particular function. And of course, we learn about those functions oftentimes when something goes wrong. But we can also look at plants. We saw um, evidence of the, the banyan tree roots that show. Most trees don't show their roots like that. And when you look at a tree, it certainly doesn't end where it meets the soil. Perhaps some of you have been in the area where there's a tree that's come down, and the first thing you say is, wow, that's a lot of biomass. <laughs> right? And all that biomass came from individual chloroplasts taking individual carbons from CO2 and stringing them together and making little carbon compounds that made bigger carbon compounds that made a tree. But more than that, the part of the tree I'm really interested in is what's below the ground, the part that interacts with the soil. Because of trees, they, they stabilize soil in many areas. And we certainly have seen the result of what happens when you take away trees, what happens to the ecosystem there. So let's look at the organismal level of some, something with a nerve net. All right, so an anemone can capture prey, doesn't even have a brain but it has a lot of organized neurons, all right? They're all specialized. Some detect the prey, some contract the tentacles, some bring the food in, all right? And some aid in digestion. The chameleon, which is one of my favorite animals, all right, does a lot of really cool things, needs a brain to do that, right? But one of the amazing things it does is capture prey with its very sticky tongue. And then an ecosystem filled with specialists, how do they make an ecosystem? There's give and take. There's communication. And especially when that ecosystem is suffering from stress, it takes all members of the system to, to reestablish homeostasis after a stressful situation. 
That requires intense amounts of communication and collaboration. And finally, the human body, one of our favorite ecosystems. You, in fact, are an ecosystem. Because, in fact, only 10% of the cells in you are human. The rest are bacterial. And before you want to all leave and go take a shower, <laughs> most of them are inside you, and most of them are beneficial. In fact, they're probably the reason you're not homesick in bed. Beyond that, the genes that are responsible for you and your behavior only a fraction of them actually come from your big genome. The rest of those genes and their products that affect your health and well-being come from your microbiome. So be nice to it. So communication. You have specialists. They have to communicate to do their thing. If a male cecropia moth never got together with a female cecropia moth, we wouldn't have any more. And they get together because of pheromones. All right? But bacteria also communicate. My friend Bonnie Bassler at Princeton talks about bacteria communicating through the air. These are two E. coli, one of which, the hairy one, is sharing its DNA with its recipient. And of course, back to the brain. The two hemispheres of the brain talk to each other through the corpus callosum. We know what happens when those ties are severed. We also get communication by other modalities, such as auditory modalities, right? Auditory signals, fabulous examples in nature. Bioluminescence, visual signals, is uh, a characteristic that's evolved many times independently throughout evolution, the glowing in the dark. And sometimes a signal can have more than one audience. So you see the yellow flowers, that's what we see visually. A prospective pollinator sees a much more welcoming landing pad. All right, so what does all this biology have to do with a good society, Amy? Well, the human society is made up of a lot of specialists. Think about the specialists that, interact, that you interact with in your life and who impact your life every day. But we're not just off in our own little worlds doing our thing. We've got to work together as a group. There are people who produce. There are people who are in finance. There are people in the service industry. There are people in the education industry. What I'd like to focus on for the rest of my talk is people who create. Now you're going to hear after me from John Alston, who creates. And you saw an example of Randy Axon's beautiful artwork in Rebecca's talk. There are artists and musicians whom we all acknowledge create. But some people might be surprised to, to learn that scientists are creative. The scientific process is absolutely creative. And the thing is, we often share our rough drafts with, the, with each other. Every model, every paper is only as good as the latest data. And you heard from Stephen Wong, it's all about the data. And so the scientific process is a creative process. People get inspiration, just like artists and composers do. All right? And the process requires imagination. All that thinking outside the box you hear of isn't just for business people. It's for, for scientists as well. And the process is iterative, it's recursive, all right? as we go back and refine our uh, hypotheses to test them anew. The key between scientists is communication. And that's where we have what I believe is a problem today. We have become so specialized that we talk with each other quite well. We have a common experience, we have common processes, we have developed our common little language. So much so that it's very difficult sometimes for us to communicate with people outside of our tribe. All right. Hence, outside of our tribe, there is often a lack of trust and an unhealthy skepticism that does not promote further discussion. Scientists communicate very well. They communicate through peer-reviewed peer publications, two of the biggest ones, Science and Nature. They're written for other scientists, but I find it difficult to read um, outside of my field these days because of the jargon. I can't even imagine what it would be like for a nine scientist to pick up Science or Nature and try to plow through a, a genetics paper. To be sure, there are magazines, and I've left many of them off, that are written for the public. But Exactly who picks those up? It's been shown in surveys, 
Most of them are picked up by scientists who want to read outside their field and they can't through, get through science and nature outside their field, so they pick up this. So really, that's not what we're after. And there is so much worth knowing. Just, just curiosity, but also thinking of helping to think hard about how we can do good. There are prehistoric findings. There are things that benefit modern life. We can talk about the acellular virus that affects us, as well as subcellular ways of communicating. We can assemble bones of a skull. We can put together membrane channels that are selective about what they'll let in and what they'll let out, and often the basis of disease. There are things we have in common, our 46 chromosomes, and there are ways to describe diversity. There are basic features that we learn about health and agriculture, and very quickly we can turn those into disease and crop treatment. And yet, most of this is inaccessible to the public. Even among scientists, it's hard to keep up with things going on in your own field, much less in allied fields. And part of it is we, we don't have a common language anymore. So when we communicate, when scientists communicate with non-scientists, it's not anything new. It's something that was noticed over 50 years ago in a lecture. And the problem is that we really need to collaborate to solve society's complex problems. We have amazing technology. We have to know what to do with it in an ethical and humanitarian manner. Charles Percy Snow gave a Reedy lecture at Cambridge University in 1959. And he said, I believe the intellectual life of the whole of Western society is increasingly being split into two polar groups. When I say the intellectual life, I mean to include also a large part of our practical life. Literary intellectuals at one pole and it, at, at the other scientists. And he was actually, this was a critique of the British educational system. But I think what he says pertains to the greater uh, arena today. In a reissue of his book, of his lecture, he uh, had some thoughts four years later. He says, between the two, a gulf of mutual incomprehension. Sometimes, particularly among the young, hostility and dislike, but all um, due to a lack of understanding. And I contend a lack of compassion for one another. If you had compassion for someone, you wouldn't speak in a different language in front of them. But that's what scientists are doing. And yet here at Swarthmore, we're all about improving the lives of the whole, right, through humanitarian projects. We have basic knowledge. We look at application. We're one of the few small colleges with a wonderful uh, engineering program. Through uh, vehicles like TED, we're trying to think about these things as a group and not in individual silos, right? And we need to think about the application of these technologies and, and scientific content to problems that affect all of us in a way that is inclusive, accessible, and humane, and sustainable. There are things being done now to bridge the two cultures. All right? John Brockman wrote a book uh, in the last decade urging scientists to communicate more broadly. And as a result of that, science cafes have popped up in many metropolitan areas. My own attempt at bridging the two cultures involved inviting my colleagues, intrepid individuals from other fields, to come and work in the lab for a month out of the year. The first two brave souls, Philip Jefferson and Cheryl Brood, um, taught me so much. If you took into directory biology and you did the antibiotic lab, you have them to thank. They convinced me to take it out of my microbiology course and place it into general biology. And what they said to me was, Amy, everybody should know about how antibiotics work and how resistance is transferred, not just microbiology students. So I did what they said. <laughs> they were followed by two more intrepid explorers. Barbara Malewski, some of you know, is still here on campus. Bruce Maxwell has moved on to become chair of Colby's computer science department. I was flattered to see that after he worked in my lab, he brought a group of Colby students back to campus the following year to present their results at a microbiology research symposium. And finally, the bravest of them all came all by himself. <laughs> Tim Burke spent the summer, part of the summer with me, 
as you can see, we have ethical treatment of faculty in my lab. <laughs> um, but he and I initiated conversations about science as part of the liberal arts, and a very important part of the liberal arts. And so I look forward to continuing those conversations with the entire community. So now at Swarthmore, what? What now and what next? I remind you, although I love our current seal, the former seal, I believe, is even more instructive. There's a microscope, a telescope, and a book. We need to be bridging these cultures. Faculty lectures, I would invite more students and, and non-science faculty to attend when a scientist is speaking. As part of the lifelong studies, I'm hoping to develop little science cafes that would be available for staff, particularly, who can't take the long uh, lifelong studies courses. Um, we need to find ways to build science literacy, not only within our curriculum, but in um, ancillary activities. We have great role models in our Swarthmore family. Maxine Singer, among other things, was awarded the National Medal of Science in 1992, recognizing her efforts to promote science education in K through 12. She's had a distinguished career and is still one of my great role models. Many of you know Bennett Larber. He is currently on our board of managers. He, to me, is the Renaissance man. All right? He used both sides of his brain equally well. Former chief of infectious disease at Temple University. He's still uh, at Temple on the faculty, but he's an artist and a musician and a true Renaissance man. And through him, we, we uh, came to know Abraham Verghese, who, to whom we bestowed an honorary degree. Um, he kind of founded the area of humane medicine and is now on the faculty at Stanford University and has written some really excellent novels. They, to me, are examples of people who are in very specialized fields who have reached out across many, many boundaries. Okay? We need to communicate with compassion. You've, we've heard about empathy. The speaker and the audience really have to give each other a chance. All right? And what we must avoid, as we heard in the last talk, was this idea of polarization. And what we must demand in our communication is rigor. We know how to do that here. What's happening elsewhere? There are wonderful books being written now that are accessible to the public. And two of my favorite uh, science educators on TV are David Suzuki, a Canadian geneticist who's on PBS. And many of you are probably more familiar with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is an American astronomer. They have uh, really increased science literacy in their areas many fold. At Rice University, Rebecca, Cardum, um, Rebecca Richards Cardum has taken students all over the world and they were recently recognized for their development of a microscope that cost $240 that can diagnose malaria and TB in the field. I'm finally going to highlight uh, the Boston Arts Academy. I happen to know the um, headmistress. And they have changed STEM into STEAM, right? They've put in the arts as part of STEM education because they believe the arts are a strong link that helps us bridge those cultures. And you'll hear much more about the arts from John Alston coming up. So let's think about building bridges across these two cultures at Swarthmore. Okay? I urge all of us to be part of that. And while we're thinking about building bridges across these cultures, let's think about some other cultures. All right? Socioeconomic divides, ethnic and racial divides, gender differences that pull us apart, doesn't have to be a bridge, could be a ferry boat, could be stepping stones, whatever you like. <laughs> but most of all, we need those bridges to be anchored in mutual respect and compassion. Without those, we really can't have a conversation. Thank you. <laughs>